Good afternoon. My name is Christina, and we are pleased to welcome you to the Washington Labs Academy webinar series. We hope you find the next hour or so useful and informative. We've developed our webinar series to deal with some of the technical and administrative issues that our customers face on a day-to-day -day basis. We recognize that engineering challenges can be complex, and we're always looking for ways to support the technology industry. Before we begin, I want to go over a few housekeeping details. First, I hope everyone is able to see the title slide on the computer. We've muted everyone's microphone to keep the meeting quality as high as possible. A recording of the presentation is underway and will be sent to all attendees. We will go through all questions at the end of the presentation as time permits. A full screen view may be preferred. Your selection at your computer can be done using the menu panel. In the menu on your screen, go to View and then select Full Screen. We estimate that the main bulk of the presentation will take about one hour and we will allow some time for questions at the end. We encourage questions during the presentation. You can submit a question by enabling the chat icon at the top or side of your screen and typing your question to the host. And we'd like to hear from you. You can contact us via phone or email or you can contact the presenter directly. Send your mail to bruce at brucearch.com. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Dr. Bruce Archambault is an IBM Distinguished Engineer Emeritus at IBM RTP and an adjunct professor at Missouri University, Rolla, Missouri. He received his BSEE degree from the University of New Hampshire in 1977 and an MSEE degree from Northeastern University in 1981. He received his PhD from the University of New Hampshire in 1997. His doctoral research was in the area of computational electromagnetics applied to real world EMC problems. He held positions at Digital Equipment Corporation and Seth Corporation, supporting product design and EM analysis. In 1997, he joined IBM in Riley, North Carolina where he was responsible for EMC tool development and use on a variety of products. Bruce has authored or co-authored a number of papers in computational electromagnetics, mostly applied to real-world EMC applications. He is the author of the book PCB Design for Real-World EMI Control and the lead author of the book titled EMI EMC Computational Modeling Handbook. He has lectured at the University of Oxford for the last 13 years. So, without further ado, let me hand the presentation over to you, Dr. Bruce. Thanks, Christina. Welcome, everyone. Uh, let me um, get my sheet screen sharing going here. Okay, you should be able to see my screen at this point. Yes, you can. Thank you. Okay, so what we're going to talk about today is um, high frequency design uh, and some effective materials. I think that um, you know most people are, are very familiar with uh, shielding. That's one of the primary ways of doing uh, uh, EMI control. Um, and of course, as as you all know you have to have a tight enclosure, electromagnetically tight enclosure with small openings, 
Uh, and of course, there's always a conflict between thermal and functionality to make sure that everything's uh, working properly. Thermal people want to get more airflow through the uh, device, through the air vents, and so forth. Um, functionality tends to be, uh, you know, don't want to close it up too tight so that's too hard to get into. Um, all those kind of things uh, are, all, are a common conflict between the EMI people and, and the other designers on a system. But the bottom line is we're really reaching the practical limit of using shielding. Um, is emissions now occurring uh, in the tens of gigahertz? As you probably know, the FCC requires us to do emissions testing to 40 gigahertz or uh, five times the highest frequency in the box. Well, at IBM not too long ago, uh, they had emissions that were above the limit at 37 and a half gigahertz because of some really fast data that was going on inside the box. And um, it was coming out through this, this traditional shielding, which wasn't good enough for that kind of frequency. And so, you know, the bottom line is that, you know, as we get higher and higher in frequency, the wavelength gets smaller and smaller. And so the um, openings need to get smaller and smaller. And as I point out here, that at 10 gigahertz, the wavelength is only three centimeters. So how effective is, a, is an opening going to be? This plot shows a, um, an indication of that. And uh, you can see that um, that I've normalized the uh, the uh, the x-axis to uh, wavelength, the, sl the slot size versus wavelength. And so, when a slot is a half a wavelength, um, there's effectively no shielding, zero dB of shielding. If we want 20 dB of shielding at 10 gigahertz, that means we have to get down to about four millimeters of an opening. And 40 dB of shielding is just a little bit more than one millimeter. And so that's pretty unreasonable size opening for uh, for most things. And so the bottom line is, is that uh, getting enough shielding is, is very difficult with traditional techniques. So if we can't reduce the size of the hole, then how about if we add some thickness to the metal? Now, honeycomb air filters have been used, especially in military uh, systems for, for many years. Um, they're still limited by wavelengths, and they're very expensive. It turns out that if you were just take a, a normal stamped metal panel and um, and add some thickness to it, then um, we end up with more shielding without having to purchase an expensive uh, honeycomb. And so I've got some examples here that you can look at um, at your leisure with 4 by 4 5 by 5 and so forth millimeter holes. And then we vary the panel thickness from the typical 1 millimeter to up to 10 millimeters to look to see what would happen with the... Um, the shielding performance. And basically what we see here is um, the, the one millimeter performance, is, uh, one millimeter thick metal is the, the purple line second up from the bottom there. And if I've got nine by nine millimeter holes, fairly good size holes, you can see that as I go thickness, if I go to uh, two thicknesses, I've increased by, uh, by three dB and the amount of shielding and, and so forth, and I can get more and more shielding. So if I absolutely require some amount of, of shielding uh, all the way up here at 10 gigahertz, if I needed like 20 dB of shielding and I needed to have 9 by 9 millimeter holes, then we can see that uh, somewhere along here I, I would have to, uh, if I wanted 20 dB at 10 gigahertz, then I'm probably going to have to have about 7 millimeters thick of the metal. And, and then we go with the seven millimeter holes, the same sort of thing, and five millimeter holes, same sort of thing. And of course, these lines are going up in amount of shielding because the size of the holes are coming down. So if I wanted that 20 dB of shielding now, I can get away with just one, uh, two millimeters of thickness if I had five by five millimeter holes. And finally, four by four millimeter holes. And so you can see that the amount of, um, the number of holes have been going up as we get bigger holes, trying to maintain the the amount of open uh, air so that for the air vent kind of thing, and the thickness of the metal. And, and the um, thermal engineers tell me that uh, going with thicker metal like this does not inhibit the uh, the airflow. And so this is this is a fine design kind of approach. In fact, I've seen a number of systems where this has been used very effectively. This chart just kind of summarizes. Um, the depth of the hole versus the amount of shielding for the different hole sizes. And so if uh, the EMC engineer 
is saying we've got to have 40 dB of shielding and he wants uh, no bigger than 5 by 5 millimeter holes. Well, you can see that the, uh, the depth of the hole needs to be two thicknesses, two millimeters. Um, but if the thermal engineer comes back and says, no, I absolutely have to have seven millimeters holes, then you can see for 40 dB, I need to go over here to uh, four millimeter thick holes. And so this chart can help you decide what you have to do to, uh, to make this work. But even once we get up, even with additional thickness, it's only going to be good up to a certain frequency. And once that half wavelength is reached, the holes are just not going to be performing anymore. And so you can see here that uh, we get down to zero dB at 30 gigahertz um, for, this, for the five millimeter holes, uh, regardless what the thickness is. And so something else has to be done if we're going to be using uh, holes of this size. And so when shielding fails us, well, obviously we can we can reduce the energy at the source, uh, but oftentimes the signals, the rise times, and so forth are needed for proper operation. We can't just tell the designers, "Sorry, you can't operate a 10 gigabit link or a 12 gigabit link uh, for now." And I know that uh, many companies are shipping 10 and 12 gigabit um, systems and planning to do so with 25 gigabit systems in the near future. So speeds are only going to increase. And we can't just go back and tell them that you have to slow down. So about the only other option we seem to have is to absorb the energy with lossy materials uh, rather than just try to contain it with shields. So when we start talking about these lossy materials, um, you know, we're familiar with, with sigma, epsilon, and mu. Uh, we usually talk about epsilon as a dielectric properties and mu as a magnetic uh, properties of the material. But really, these are complex numbers. And I show here that we have a, uh, a mu prime and a, I mean, yeah, a mu prime and a mu double prime, epsilon prime and an epsilon double prime. And uh, the, the single prime is the, uh, uh, the, the parameter that we're going to use for phase delay. The double prime is where we get the loss. It's the imaginary part of the uh, material. And so we can look at the, um, some typical materials, and, and I'm not picking on these particular materials for any good reason other than I happen to have them convenient. And you can see how, depending on the material, the uh, real part may be uh, varying or not varying, and the imaginary part uh, will vary some, some other way. And so uh, the imaginary part, again, is where we get the, uh, the loss from it. And we can also find that some of these materials will have loss both in the electric field and magnetic field. And so the uh, permittivity and permeability are both um, important here. Uh, again, the imaginary part of both the permittivity and permeability is what's important to um, understand how much energy will be absorbed at an over what frequency range. So when we use these lossy materials now, we can use them in different ways. I'll start out with the uh, air vents. And basically what I'm going to do with the air vent is create a sandwich of two stamped panels and a lossy material in between it and have the holes go all the way through so the air still can go through it. But then we'll also talk about heat sinks, cables, and just resonant cavities as well as we go through this. So here's an example of different uh, materials with different um, st structures. And the part that I've highlighted up here at the high frequencies above 10 gigahertz, you can see that the, uh, the energy was, the amount of loss, I should say, was uh, decreasing. But then on some of these materials, it actually increases again and gives us some significant loss above 0 dB, um, 20 or 30 dB of, of, of absorption, um, effectively shielding uh, even at 10 gig, uh, 30 gigahertz. And so the, um, the material can really help an awful lot when we do this. And, um, and again, we're just creating a simple sandwich with two stamped metal panels that's one millimeter thick typically, and then uh, some amount of material in between the uh, in between the, the two. Now the other thing that we can do is um, think about heat sinks. When we uh, have heat sinks above our circuit board, oftentimes these heat sinks are much larger than the uh, ICs themselves, and so we might ground the heat sinks to the printed circuit board ground plane to try to reduce the emissions. And if, we're, if we do this right, it de definitely will reduce the emissions up to about three gigahertz or so. But if we don't do it right, not enough grounding points, then we can actually increase the emissions. 
But um, when we get up to much higher frequencies, the grounding of the heat sink is, becomes uh, pretty much impractical because you need a continuous ground all the way around, and then you need to have lots and lots of vias stitching from the surface where the, where the finger stock or the contact is made on the top of the circuit board, and you have to have lots of vias down to the inside layers where the ground planes are. And while that's, that's a fine shield, all these vias mean that the wiring channels that the designers need to actually get the signals away from the IC are, uh, are inhibited. And so uh, the amount of, of these grounding vias that we can have is very limited. So we can use lossy materials to, um, to make this improvement at higher frequencies rather than have to have so many grounding vias and grounding points. And the measurements here I'll be showing you are all done in a reverb chamber. And the re reason we do a reverberation chamber is that uh, it doesn't matter in what direction the signals come out, the reverb chamber will catch it. Where if I go into a regular semi-anechoic room, then I have to make sure that the, um, the energy is actually coming out in the direction that aimed at my antenna. And so here in the upper picture here, we're showing a typical um, and circuit board stack up with some power planes, ground planes, and signal layers, and so forth. Um, an IC package on here, and, and, a, and a heat sink. And you can see the, the emissions coming out from underneath there. Typically, at high frequencies, we get we excite cavity modes underneath this heat sink, and so the emissions actually aren't coming off of the heat sink itself, but from from down below the heat sink. And then the lower picture here is showing in purple the um, um, the lossy material that's surrounding the package. And I think the next, here's a, a picture of the uh, fixture where we created a heat sink over a ground plane. There's a simple thing where we come up from the bottom uh, underneath the circuit board with a, with a simple SMA connector and extend the center conductor up to actually touch onto the, uh, the base of the heat sink there. And then we put the lossy material around it, the, the gray material that you see here is either 300 or 500 mils for this particular experiment. Um, and it, it basically goes from underneath the, uh, underneath the base of the heat sink to down and touching on the ground plane. And this particular material um, has no conductivity, electrical conductivity, all the losses in the uh, magnetic fields. So this way here, we don't care if it's resting right on top of the circuit board with traces and so forth, because it's not going to short things out. All right, so again, we're going to use a reverb chamber because the uh, semi anechoic chamber has a limited area where the emissions are actually received. Um, yet, you know, you're, we rotate our product 360 degrees, but the antennas only go from one to four meters, and so any emissions that kind of go up or off at some other angle are, are missed. But in the reverb chamber, we can capture the emissions no matter what direction they come off. And also what's nice is that it's immune to uh, cables and cable position especially and, and so forth. Uh, however the emissions come off, we'll be able to capture it and, uh, and see the difference. So basically, a reverb chamber is just a metal walled room, if you're not familiar with them, without absorber material on the walls. Um, we have a, a receive antenna here that's aimed off into the corner and uh, we have our product and in this case we use a network analyzer to drive the signal and, and then the receive antenna picks up the signal and brings it back and we get an S21 type measurement that we can compare with and without the absorber material. And up here in the upper right corner is where the tuner is and basically that is a stepper motor that turns this uh, metal um, metal panels around to change the boundary conditions in the room and so that the uh, the room will be very resonant and that's okay. We want to have those resonances and we embrace those resonances and use them to, uh, to find the differences between the cases. And this just shows an example of one that we did at IBM, uh, kind of homemade thing, went down to Home Depot, bought some metal panels and uh, some threaded rod that bolt all these things together and then bought a step promoter off the uh, internet and uh, hook it up to a computer to, to control this uh, uh, this panel. And here's a kind of examples, example of the kind of results we get. This is, um, again, a particular type of material from our technologies, and the y-axis is how much the emissions are reduced, so we want these numbers to be higher, and you can see that um, if we have uh, 
500 mil wide material, we get more emissions reduced, you know, all, as much as 35 dB. And when we went with a smaller amounts of material, we still got over 20 dB. You notice also that down below a few gigahertz, it's not much happening down here. Uh, this material is, is really rated at high frequencies, and so we can use the traditional grounding to um, control the lower lower frequencies, low being, in this case, below a couple gigahertz, and above a couple gigahertz, the loss of material takes over. It does a good job. And different materials give us different amounts of, of uh, loss or absorption, and over a different frequency range. Uh, again, though, they're, they really only operate at higher frequencies. And finally, uh, another material. Okay, um, if we this material is you pay by the volume, and so the target was to try to reduce the cost. So could we get away with only having a little bit of loss of material here? In fact, it's, I'm showing it on the just sitting on the circuit board. We also did it just underneath the uh, heat sink and got the same results. And it's no big surprise, I'm sure, that when we only had partial height, we've got less less absorption, less loss. Um, and is it when we have le less material, we also have less loss. But still, if we only needed a few dB, then having uh, a partial height, you know, that's only 100 or 300 mils wide, could do a good job for us, uh, rather than the full full, um, full size absorption. Okay, so. Basically, the materials I showed here, um, they all reduced the emissions above about 3 to 4 gigahertz. More material gives us more loss, and uh, the full height between the heat sink and the printed circuit board gives us more loss than just a partial height. But again, if we only need a few dB, that might be good enough to uh, reduce the cost. All right. Now, another thing we could do is coat some cables. And so oftentimes, the cables themselves on a system are the biggest source of EMI emissions. Um, somehow the energy gets onto the cable, either because the cable back shell is not well shielded, or uh, it could even be that the um, the box itself is 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 not as good a shielding as possible, and, and the currents get out onto the cables that way. And sometimes we just have unshielded cables. Um, a good example of that is Ethernet cables, where we have differential pairs. Um, that might have common mode noise on them. Uh, we talked about that, uh, I think, uh, last time. But uh, the, the the bottom line is, is that somehow or other this energy gets on there, and if we're going to try to shield an Ethernet cable, you know, you've all seen the way the uh, Ethernet cables are and, and how they plug in. You can see that this would be very difficult to actually have a, a metal, a good RF tight metal seal from the cable through the, the connector onto the uh, computer or whatever it is. So it's very difficult to, to have a low cost solution to that. So we looked into losing lossy material for that and just coating the, the material, uh, coating the cable rather with lossy material. This can even be done underneath a normal um, jacket, plastic jacket that you have on the cable. So it doesn't even show up. And here's an example of a, of a large mainframe system that had a lot of Ethernet cables coming out and um, it was over the, the cables, the noise on the cables was over the limit. And so we needed to have a few dB reduction. In this case, it only took a few dB. And you can see all these big black ferrite beads, you know, that EMC engineers know and love. And that's what was required to make the system pass. And that's what prompted us to start looking into other alternatives like uh, lossy material on cables. So again, we're going to use a reverb chamber, and now instead of having the, uh, the heat sink in there, we have these little boxes that convert from the coax to the Ethernet cable, and then the other box at the other end just terminates the Ethernet cable. And we'll look at the differences between having a cable with the lossy material on it or not lossy material. And it turns out that um, you can actually get this lossy material in a heat shrink type configuration. So we, we put that onto the uh, cable. You can see a picture here of the regular cable and then just added this lost material in heat shrink and heat it up with a heat shrink gun and, and shrunk it onto there. And, and, um, and you can see also that this is not an RF tight connection. You know, the connector itself is, is wide open just like it was uh, on a regular cable. So we don't need a watertight connection here. Uh, where shielding requires a complete coverage. So that's one of the real benefits of lossy material. 
And as I mentioned earlier, we could just extrude this lossing material onto the cable during cable manufacturing. And I know that uh, some of the cable companies are, are actually doing this. So we, we did, we wanted to see if we could just um, completely cover the cable or partially cover the cable. So you can see we did some with only a little bit of coverage, uh, 11 inches, 23 inches, or 37 inches. And then we even did one down here in the lower right where we had two inch sections that were spaced an inch apart because we wanted to show that it didn't matter whether we had, um, if, if the material was continuous or not. You would really wouldn't do this in manufacturing, especially if you're extruding it as, as you make the cable, it would be continuous, but we wanted to see that if the material was to have a, a gap or something or a crack or whatever, where that would be devastating with the traditional metal shielding, it was okay with uh, the lossy material. And so we, we drove both ends, the end with the lossy material and the end without the lossy material. And, uh, and as I said, the effect of the, the not full coverage was looked at as well. And so here's the kind of results we get. The reduction in emissions so we, we, is the uh, y-axis. So we took a cable without any uh, material on it and took that as our baseline and then um, you know, tried the different cases and saw how much the emissions were reduced. And you can see here over a frequency range up to about five or six gigahertz, we're getting some reduction. If we only had 11 inches covered, well, there wasn't much, much uh, reduction. But once we get up to 23 and 37, our fully covered cable, you can see that we were getting uh, 8 to 10 dB from about a gigahertz up to uh, 4 or 5 gigahertz, which was in the frequency range that we were concerned with for this particular set of products. And then if we um, drove the other end of the cable, well, it's probably no big surprise that the emissions get to radiate if we drive the end without the lossy material on it. Uh, of course, the fully covered cable still gave us the same loss no matter what we, no matter whether we drove it at one end or the other. And then finally, when we had the, um, the two inch sections with an inch in between them, you can see that the, uh, the amount of reduction in emissions was about the same as a fully covered cable, um, showing that uh, the loss of material does not have to be continuous. It's fine if it is, but if there's a crack or some kind of void in manufacturing, again, that would be devastating with a regular metal shield, devastating from a shielding point of view, but from a loss of material point of view, it's not a problem. And just kind of shows you some uh, averaged numbers to, to show with the, uh, the difference between the cable. And you can see that uh, with and without the material, we're getting somewhere between uh, maybe 7 dB reduction, um, worst case, and, uh, and as much as 10, 12 dB reduction over most of the frequency range here shown from 1 to 5 gigahertz. Okay, so the code, coded cables can certainly reduce the emissions. And again, the full coverage is not required. Um, we uh, are, are not worried about cracks um, as we would for traditional shielding. Okay, and then finally, sometimes we end up with, with um, cavities that have resonances. And um, this is, occurs when our enclosure is, is uh, empty or partially empty. Um, so we get standing waves that can build up depending on the physical size. You know, we can we can calculate the uh, the dimensions uh, on an on a empty rectangular cavity, empty metal box, but in a complex enclosure where we have power supplies and cables and circuit boards and so forth, it's very difficult to predict. In fact, uh, you need a full wave tool to be able to do that. But we're going to work here with an empty metal box just to look at the difference between uh, different materials and putting them in different places here. So the box that we were using is um, about 10 inches by 12 inches by 6 inches. And uh, you can see there's a horizontal slot here and vertical slot. And down in the lower left here, we have our source antenna inside. We're just going to bring a cable up and, and drive this, this wire here that's just uh, uh, loaded at one end with 50 ohms, and just the goal is to create fields in all directions. And then we're going to put some lossy material. Here's an example of, of some material on the cover. And we're going to look at the difference in emissions coming out of the box through the slots with and without lossy material. So again, we can calculate the uh, size uh, to the size of the box. We can calculate what the frequencies would be. And this just shows here the formula that we used. And, uh, 
and the, the different TE modes, D11 and 101 and so forth, and what the frequencies are that we would expect the uh, resonances to occur in. Okay, so here we're showing the, uh, the, the blue is the box without any lossy material in it. Uh, in this particular case, we had some material that we put on the top cover. And you can see, for example, this TE110 mode gets reduced quite a bit. Uh, the TE101 mode also gets reduced. And so you can see that certainly the, uh, the, some of these modes are, are being reduced down, and we're able to identify those modes based on the physical size of the enclosure. Um, if, we, if we put the material on the top, like the previous chart, or we put it over on the left-hand side, you can see that it makes a little difference on some of the modes, but not a, not a heck of a lot. Uh, we get some reduction. Uh, yeah. If we uh, if we put it both on the top and the left, well, there's twice as much material now, and we're actually getting more loss, as you can see in this chart. Most of the modes are, are being reduced down quite a bit. Um, one of the things that we found was that we had this mode down here at, at below our TE110 mode that wasn't really being reduced. And it turns out that that's a slot resonance for the horizontal slot. And so if we just put the material on the top, you can see we, the green line shows the, this mode came down a little bit, but not very much, not, nothing like what happened a little higher in frequency. But once we just put some of this material around the slot on the inside, um, still allowing the slot to be open, um, you can see that we, we made a much more significant reduction. Some of the materials didn't work as well as others. Um, this material didn't do much at lower frequencies, didn't really start kicking into much higher frequencies. Um, so basically, the, the, the testing shows that the, um, uh, the modes can be established when the, for the loss of material inside uh, the box, and, and the loss of material will reduce the, uh, the resonant modes. Um, I was using a, a two-port measurement here, which basically required the um, the slots to allow us to have the energy come out. But um, that means that not all the, the modes might be captured because some of them might not be transmitted through that slot, even though it's kind of long. So we um, also looked into a single port measurement that where we can measure the Q factor. And that allows the requirement, that, I mean, that eliminates the requirement for the slot to allow energy to come out. And so uh, David Green at our technology did a lot of this work, <clears throat> and this was presented in Denver EMC Symposium in 2013. And so here's the kind of, of results that we get looking at the, uh, the decay of the resonance. And the, uh, the blue line at the top here is showing with no absorber, and then we can see the effect of different types of absorbing material. And as the decay happens faster, uh, the x-axis is the time here, so, the, so basically the, the a pulse is put into the box, and we look to see how long it takes before that um, pulse is ab absorbed and decayed out completely. The steeper the slope, the uh, more absorption, the more loss. And so we can actually calculate how the Q factor has changed from no absorber being about 30 to coming down to uh, on the order of 23. 25, depending on the material, and you can actually see um, which material is working better. Uh, this is at three and a half gigahertz, so you can see which material is, is working better for you at this frequency. We also did the same thing at a different frequency, and again, you can you can see the difference in the uh, in the Q factor. Uh, the Q factor without the absorber material is much higher, and uh, but still comes down as we try different materials. And again, just to remind you, the steeper slope is uh, an indication of more absorption going on in the uh, loss of material. So to summarize all this, the um, traditional EMC approaches of shielding at high frequencies um, cannot work. Uh, we're, we're, about, we're about broken, I think. Um, at some, in some systems, especially when you have really high frequencies, they're going to be at, um, at a point where we can't um, uh, just keep on doing the shielding. So something else has to be done, and using absorbing materials is, is the way to go. Um, I think that um, using these materials, we can, we can control emissions, 
and it helps with immunity as well. Uh, and we can use these materials in a number of different ways. We can use them under heat sinks, um, around air vents and sandwiches, uh, coatings on cables, breaking up cavity residences. Um, there's a lot of different ways that they can be used. Um, currently, though, it's difficult to predict the effects without doing some testing or making some simulations. Um, we, we, we do simulations. I showed you some, some of that uh, here. I also showed you some measurements. Uh, but we need more work done to uh, allow the relationship between the complex epsilon and mu as a function of frequency to predict which materials are going to be effective um, in, in doing what we would need them to do. I suggest that as you talk to vendors who sell this material, you, uh, you ask them uh, about how the material performs in, in this particular application. You notice that uh, when we put the material on, on a cable, we got maybe 10 dB of, of improvement. When we put it under heat sinks, we got 30 dB of improvement. So of course, the amount of material is different in those two cases, but the vendors should be able to provide you with um, uh, information on how the material perform, how their material performs in your particular application. And I think it's up to the vendors to be able to tell us that and not just tell us um, radar reflection and things like that, unless that's what you're really interested. I know a couple of companies are actively doing research in this area. Arc Technologies and Laird both are doing research in this area, and uh, probably the others are as well. I'm just not aware of it. Okay, so that's um, the end of my presentation. Um, are there any questions? Hi, Bruce. Yes, we, we have quite a few questions, actually. Um, let's start with this one. Uh, do honeycomb filters have a polarity? No, no. Usually the honeycomb filter, um, I mean, it, it looks like a, uh, a bumblebee hive, you know, and so the, uh, uh, the dimension is about the same in all directions, and so there's really no polarity involved with that. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, in your experiment on Ethernet cables, did the lossy material do a better job of attenuating unwanted sig signals than the ferrite? Yes, it did, actually. Um, the ferrite was um, not very effective above a gigahertz, um, those, those big uh, ferrite beads. I mean, we were able to get enough attenuation out of them so we could ship the product, but uh, we found that the lossy material coating the cables did a better job and was less expensive than the, uh, the big ferrite beads. Okay, interesting. Okay, uh, next question. When using thick metal for increased shielding and two separate panels used, or, uh, do they need to touch continuously? No, in fact, um, I really didn't show that, but if you were to say, if you decided you needed um, two millimeter thick and you wanted to use two one millimeter thick panels, you put them together, there may be a little bit of oil canning so that they're not touching continuously, and that actually improves the amount of shielding that you get. In fact, putting a little bit of space, like putting a spacer of, of a few millimeters in between the two panels can actually help the, uh, the shielding quite dramatically. Okay. Um, let's see. The, uh, does the application of lossy material on cable affect the impedance? Well, um, if you have a unshielded differential cable, it's going to affect the common mode impedance, yes. But that's really what you want to do, actually, is you want to make the common mode impedance um, such that it won't radiate, and, uh, but it won't change the differential impedance. And if you have a shielded cable you plot, and you would apply this on the outside of the shield, of course, then, um, then no, it's not going to change the inside impedance of the cable. Okay. That's um, a good question. Um, when using lossy absorptive material for air vents, must two metal panels be used as a sandwich or can only one metal panel be used? Yes, basically, um, you could use one metal panel and the lossy material. The, the metal panel will give you the performance at, at low frequencies, and the, and the absorbing material will give you the performance at high frequencies. Uh, if you needed more 
performance at lower frequencies than using the, the sandwich with two middle panels would be required. But but in most cases, you can probably get away with just one. Okay. Um, let's see. Which cable manufacturer offers cables with lossy coatings? Uh, right now, um, Samtech is the only cable manufacturer that I know of that's doing that. I, I know it's been used in a couple of applications for companies. Um, for example, one of the, the more famous um, computer companies out there um, on, on the West Coast that everybody uh, knows and loves. Um, one of their products, uh, this is Apple Computer, one of their products for a while they were shipping with a uh, with a mouse that had a uh, had a lossy material underneath the uh, plastic coating, and users never knew about it. Wow. Of course. Okay. Um. I think yeah, we have one more. It looks like. Uh, can absorber be applied as an enclosure coating? Um. On the, I guess, if you're going to do that, you would have to do it on. I don't know. I guess on the inside. If you do it on the inside, it'll break up resonances. Um, of course, you have to make sure that it doesn't inhibit airflow through air vents and things like that. Um, I, I guess you could use it on the outside as well. I mean, that's kind of what uh, stealth fighters do, right? They they uh, have they were coating the uh, airplane on the outside with uh, uh, lossy material. Um, of course, they're worried about radar reflection. From a, a traditional EMI point of view, if we've got leakage around slots and so forth, what tends to happen is the, the currents get on the outside of the box. If we were to put the lossy material on the outside of the box, then that would absorb that those currents and, and uh, they wouldn't cause radiation. So I haven't seen that done, but I don't see why you couldn't do it. Interesting. That's interesting. Okay. Yeah. Um, Looking, you know, we had so many of these questions come in, so I want to make sure I got all of them. Uh, yeah, I do believe. Yep, I've answered all the questions. Hopefully, there's not any more coming in. Uh, <laughs> nope, it looks like that. That's the end of the question. So, okay. thanks a lot for that. It was very interesting. Well, thank you. And. Uh, as you said earlier, I'm more than happy for anybody that attended to send me an email directly uh, to ask uh, questions if something comes up later. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> I guess uh, today, of course, was uh, the conclusion of our Bruce Six Pack series on the EMC design. Um, we have recordings of each session available. Uh, Bruce, I'm sure. You've got some upcoming events uh, on your agenda. Perhaps you'd like to take a moment to discuss them. Sure. Well, if you, um, I teach seminars uh, on uh, on an ongoing basis, um, often two or three day seminars. Uh, for those that are already scheduled, you can go to my website, brucearch.com, and um, those those are on there. Uh, as you mentioned, Christina, uh, I'll be teaching at Oxford University. Um, in fact, I'll be doing that uh, the first couple weeks in July. I'll be out there teaching, so that's coming up very soon. If anybody wants to get get away from the heat and get over to Oxford, England, um, hurry up and, and get over there. Um, I'll also be teaching an advanced DMC class in uh, Massachusetts in October. And I also um, come into companies and teach, um, you know, within a company focused on their kind of products uh, as much as they want. So. Excellent. All right, great. That's awesome. So um, <clears throat> I think, yeah, let me take a, a couple minutes and we'll go over just quickly the upcoming uh, Washington Labs training. Of course, the uh, on-screen URL connects you to the Academy page and we have lots of information on upcoming Webinars, resident courses available in a variety of engineering, design, and testing topics. I've uh, got some of them listed here. The wireless device approval webinar series. Uh, we have July 15th webinar scheduled at 3 p.m. And the topic is SAR and radiation hazards from transmitters. 
The MIL 461 testing is also a series covering the EMC testing to MIL standard 461. Uh, session 7 of 12 will be happening at 1 p.m. Eastern on July 15th, covering CS115 and CS116. Product safety, the next webinar is on insulation design with pre-agent clearance. That's scheduled for July 16th at 1 p.m. Eastern. The IEC ENFCC testing webinar series is well underway. We have session three happening tomorrow, June 25th, and we'll be discussing CW immunity. Um, as with today's webinar, the previous webinars from each of the series are available as recordings through the Academy website. We also provide customized training at your place or ours, and webinars are available in multi-part series, so you can mix and match them. You may take one session or a few from any combination of available webinars from any multi-part series, or sign up for a complete offering of all the Academy training courses happening throughout the calendar year. So please be sure to visit the Academy training webpage to check out the latest training course topics and dates. And also, we'd like to hear from you with suggestions on future topics that we can present. So before we wrap up, let me take a little look, make sure I didn't get any other questions. Uh, we had a great question and answer session. Would you agree? Uh, I believe yes, this yes. is going to conclude today's webinar. All right. So okay. on behalf of myself and Washington Labs and Dr. Bruce Archambault, I want to thank everybody for attending. Yep. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Dr. Bruce. And yep. I want to end the event. I would like everybody to enjoy the rest of their afternoon. And until next time, we'll see you again. Bye-bye.